and leads the next closest supplier by about eight points of customer spend. In the June quarter, we secured another win for a critical deposition application and are now the tool of record for all manned manufacturers for this process. Instrumental to our success has been the differentiation afforded by our quad station chamber design. Our multi-station architecture, refined over many years, allows us to use sequential processing to precisely tailor film properties to meet the needs of next generation devices without compromising the productivity required for high volume NAND, DRAM, and foundry logic manufacturing. Another example where we believe we are well positioned to benefit from rising complexity is through our enablement of higher quality surface conditioning. Surface properties have been shown to greatly impact device performance, and existing surface preparation methods are in many cases insufficient to meet the stricter requirements for new materials and tighter dimensional control at advanced nodes. For the foundry logic segment, we recently introduced a range of novel selective etch, strip, and surface treatment solutions that use our ultra high selectivity, zero damage process capability to remove unwanted materials with minimal impact to other layers. We are gaining significant momentum with this new approach with multiple LAM tools selected by a large customer in the June quarter as tool of record for leading edge applications. We plan to share more details on this innovation in the near future. Additional opportunities for LAM are being driven by the need for higher pattern fidelity as foundry logic pitch tolerances tighten. For extremely small features, the relationship between change in resistance to change in dimension is exponential, therefore necessitating an extreme level of precision in device fabrication and advanced nodes. Even small variations in pattern roughness can degrade RC and transistor speed. In response, we have developed Edge solutions such as our ARIA plasma pulsing capability to reduce line roughness by up to 30%. This technology has proven to be a key enabler for many critical etch applications. And when combined with our proprietary uniformity and RF power solutions, has helped LAM maintain our overall market leading position in multi patterning etch. As the industry transitions to even more demanding EUV patterning, we are seeing success applying these technology solutions to win new EUV patterning steps. Solving complex scaling challenges, including transitions to 3D structures in foundry logic and DRAM, will not be accomplished without deeper collaboration across the ecosystem. Our customers are increasingly highlighting the need for closer partnerships with the equipment industry to meet their overall device performance and cost roadmaps. As a result, we continue to expand R&D investments closer to customers with the aim of accelerating new application development, shortening cycles of learning, and strengthening our understanding of the customer's most difficult problems. In addition to these regional R&D investments, I am pleased to announce that we recently shipped our first modules from our new Malaysia factory. This new facility adds resiliency to our global manufacturing network creates capability closer to key customers and supply chain partners, and provides us with urgently needed capacity to support our continuing growth. I would like to acknowledge the tremendous efforts of the LAM employees and partners that completed the Malaysia project on time, despite the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. In our customer support business, June quarter revenue growth again outpaced growth in chamber count. Our service, upgrades, and Reliant businesses all delivered record quarters. Reliant has now shown growth for 10 consecutive quarters, driven by strong investments in power, CIS, and non-leading edge foundry. We achieved in the quarter a key edge penetration at one of the top 5G RF providers, exhibiting our technical leadership in this space. Also, the Spares team executed a major contract at a key customer in Asia which secures a stream of revenue from our installed base. While quarter on quarter CSPG growth rates can vary based on customer investment patterns, we are very well positioned to deliver strong calendar year growth with a portfolio of products and services 
focused on our customers' operational success. We are increasing the productivity of our customers' tools and extending the life of their equipment, which contributes to lowering the overall environmental impact of semiconductor manufacturing. On the topic of sustainability, I would like to share a few highlights for the company. In June, we released our annual environmental, social, and governance report. I am very proud of our organization's efforts last year to support the needs of the communities in which we work and live, to keep our employees safe through the COVID-19 pandemic, and to advance inclusion and diversity across our global workplace. This year's report introduced our goals of operating on 100% renewable energy by 2030 and achieving carbon net zero by 2050. We are driving innovations in product and process solutions in support of our sustainability objectives. For instance, our new Sensei Edge platform improves power efficiency and requires less aluminum raw material for tool construction. Our new drive resist technology uses five to 10 times less chemistry and two times less energy than the current process of record. Our parts cleaning, repair, refurbishment, and recoding services are enabling more reuse and lessening waste. These solutions drive sustainability and make LAM products more competitive in the marketplace. I encourage you to check out our, the report on our website to learn more. So to wrap up, we had an outstanding quarter and fiscal year. Most importantly, as we look to the future, we see rising device complexity and continuing transitions to 3D architectures driving growth for LAM. Thank you all for listening today, and now here's Doug. Thank you, Jim. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining our call today on what I know is a very busy earnings season. As the world continues to face challenges with the pandemic, I hope you and your families have been safe and healthy since we last spoke with you. LAM continued to deliver outstanding performance with record quarterly revenue, operating income, and earnings per share in the June 2021 quarter. Our revenue, gross margin, and operating income came in at or above the midpoint of our guidance, and earnings per share were above our guidance range. We're extremely pleased with our operational execution, and we thank all of our customers, suppliers, and employees for their dedication and support. Our revenue for the June quarter was $4.15 billion, represented an increase of 8% from the March quarter. We had record Excuse me, we had record revenue in both our systems and our customer support business group. So we're going to turn to the details on systems revenue. The memory segment continues to be an area of strength for LAM and represented 59% of systems revenue in the June quarter. The NAND segment concentration was essentially flat with the prior quarter at 49% of our systems revenue and again hit another record level in terms of revenue dollars. We saw customer investments in both capacity ads and conversions, the spending primarily on 128-layer class devices. In the DRAM segment, we had 10% of our June quarter systems revenue versus 14% in the prior quarter. The DRAM investments were concentrated mainly in the 1Z and 1Alpha nodes. And I would just mention, we do see DRAM spending strengthening into the second half of this year. For the Foundry segment, we had our second consecutive quarter of record revenues, coming in at 35% of our June systems revenue, as compared with 31% in the March quarter. Foundry spending is occurring in both leading edge and mature technologies to meet the end demand for various market drivers like AI, 5G, and gaming, as well as specialty chips needed for things like IoT, image sensors, and power devices. And finally, Logic and Other contributed the remaining 6% of systems revenue in the June quarter, which was essentially flat to the prior quarter percentage. Now, looking at the regional profile of our total revenue, the China region came in at 37% of our total revenues, up from 32% in the March quarter. The spending profile for the China region was generally balanced between the domestic and multinational customers with their fabs that are located in China. 
The Korea region also contributed or continued to be very strong in the June quarter, representing 30% of revenues. CSPG, which is our installed base business, came in at nearly $1.4 billion, which as I noted is another high point for this group. The revenue level is an increase of 6% from the March quarter and 49% higher than the same quarter in 2020. All of the sub-segments of this business are delivering excellent performance. The Reliant product line that serves specialty market, upgrades where we're extending the life of our customers' tools, as well as spares and service that are, support, that are supporting the high industry utilizations. All sub-segments strongly contributed in the quarter. So now let me shift to profitability. June quarter gross margin was 46.5%, right at the midpoint of the guided range. I'll remind you that our gross margins fluctuate quarter to quarter due to overall business levels, along with customer and product mix. I would mention there continues to be elevated air, air freight and logistics costs due to the COVID environment impacting us in the current quarter, which are also reflected in the September quarter guidance. Operating expenses per June were $574 million, slightly higher than the prior quarter. You may note in our earnings release that we did incur a charge during the quarter of approximately $6 million related to an asset impairment of the product line that we're shutting down. This charge was excluded from our non-GAAP operating expenses. We've demonstrated our ability to scale the company profitably as we've continued to decrease operating expenses as a percent of revenue. I'll also note that we've continued to prioritize R&D spending to ensure that we have the resources to continue to build on our technically differentiated leadership positions, and we've maintained an emphasis on R&D spending, and it continues to represent approximately two-thirds of our operating expenses. Your quarter operating margin showed solid performance coming in over the midpoint of our guidance range at 32.6%, reflecting strong gross margin and operating expense management. This operating income percentage represents an all-time high watermark for LAM research. Our non-GAAP tax rate for the quarter was 12.6%, generally in line with our expectations. And as we've noted in prior calls, our tax rate will fluctuate from quarter to quarter. We expect the ongoing tax rate to be in the low teens level for the 2021 calendar year. And I would just mention, we're continuing to monitor potential tax changes that are under discussion in the current United States administration. Other income and expense was approximately $23 million in expense which is lower than the prior quarter as a result of a $30 million market gain in one of our venture capital investments. As we previously noted, OINE is subject to market-related volatility that could cause a difference from any typical run rate. And also, just to remind you, beginning in the March quarter of 2020, the benefits and costs of our Employee Deferred Compensation Plan are no longer mismatched in our non-GAAP results. This mismatch was $17 million for the June 2021 quarter. And if you're interested, you can see the details in the gap reconciliation tables in the earnings release. So now let me shift to capital return. We paid $185 million in dividends and allocated $440 million towards share buyback. This is in line with our long-term capital return plans of 75 to 100% of our free cash flow. Earnings per share came in at $8.09 above the guidance range. The outperformance is due to the higher revenue and expense management, as well as the favorability I noted in OINE. The diluted share account balance was down slightly from the March quarter level, coming in at 144 million shares. During the June quarter, we redeemed the remaining 2041 convertible notes, which I'm happy to tell you is the last convert that was in our capital structure. Let me shift to the balance sheet. Cash and short-term investments, including restricted cash, totaled $6 billion, which is flat with the prior quarter. We had record performance in the June quarter for cash flows from operations, which came in at $1.4 billion. 
During the quarter, our cash generation was deployed to the pay down of $800 million of senior notes that were due in June, as well as cash outlays for the capital return activities that I mentioned. Day sales outstanding was flat to the March quarter at 66 days. Inventory turns were up slightly from the prior quarter level, coming in at 3.3 times. June quarter non-cash expenses included approximately $56 million for equity compensation, $60 million for depreciation, and $18 million for amortization. We are investing in increasing our capacity and support of customers, and as a result, capital expenditures for the June quarter were up from the March level and came in at $105 million. We have investments occurring around the globe with our new Malaysia factory, which is formally opening this quarter, expansion in our U.S. critical spare parts facility in Ohio, and R&D investments in our new Korean lab facility. We expect to see somewhat levels, of, uh, somewhat elevated levels, excuse me, of capital expenditures in the remainder of calendar year 2021 as we support these growth initiatives. The headcount level ending the June quarter was approximately 14,100 regular full-time employees. Resources have been added in our factories and in the field to meet the increased output levels and to support customers in their technology evaluations as well as tool installation requirements. My final commentary to touch on for the June quarter is a follow-up in the ESG space which obviously is strategically important for LAM research. In June, we extended and upsized our revolving credit facility to $1.5 billion. We transitioned this facility to a sustainability-linked revolver, which includes a pricing structure that is linked to certain performance metrics for energy savings and employee safety. In addition to the ESG focus areas that Tim noted, this credit facility is further demonstration of our commitment to integrate ESG principles into all aspects of how we operate as a company. So now looking ahead, I'd like to provide our non-GAAP guidance for the September 2021 quarter. We're expecting revenue of $4.3 billion, plus or minus $250 million. Gross margin of 46%, plus or minus one percentage point, operating margins of 32%, plus or minus one percentage point, and finally, earnings per share of $8.10, plus or minus 50 cents, based on a share count of approximately 143 million shares. We continue to maintain a widened revenue range as we work to mitigate ongoing output challenges in our global supply chain. These supply chain challenges are also driving a modest headwind in our guided gross margin. Customer demand continues to look strong in the second half of 2021, as well as into next year. LAM is operating at record levels of financial performance as a result of the tireless efforts of our operational organizations and supply chain partners. We continue to progress on our longer-term share gain objectives with investments in new platforms like Sensei and Dry Resist. We'd like to thank the company for rising to the challenge and delivering on these objectives. Operator, that concludes my prepared remarks. Tim and I would now like to open up the call for questions. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please signal by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you were using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. Again, press star 1 to ask a question. We'll take our first question from John Pitzer of Credit Suisse. Yeah, good afternoon, guys. Thanks for letting me ask the question. Tim, notwithstanding your comments in your prepared commentary about still feeling comfortable that the industry is spending at healthy levels. For us out here, it's, it's all too seductive to kind of look at where your NAND quarterly revenue run rate is today and, and, and go back and look at where that peaked in 18 to see that it's higher. And, and 
I, I guess maybe you can help us out. If you think about just the overall growth in complexity of NAND since 18, and, and I guess more importantly, your market share gains, how do we look at this number in the June quarter and compare it to sort of the 1.287 you did in, in the March 18 quarter? Yeah, it's a, uh, obviously a question that we uh, spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, and I think you, you hit on the most important point, which is, you know, what has it meant for LAM to see not only the transition to 3D, which I gave some, some element of how it changed our position in terms of share of WFE over the last five years. Uh, that was my comment, the over six points of share gain of WFE. And, but more importantly, what are we doing going forward to ensure kind of durability in this business meaning defending the positions we've, we've, we've worked hard to gain, but also benefiting from the complexity that's, that's occurring because of layer scaling. And that's really our product focus. And so maybe to talk about complexity, number of layers increasing um, you know, clearly is, is uh, driving a strong demand for the tools that deposit those, those film stacks, etch the holes in those film stacks, and uh, backfill them with the metalization. Those are the strongest positions LAM has within NAND, and we feel extremely good about their, um, our defensibility of those positions. Um, but even those are seeing changes, and so it's different materials, for instance, to reduce line resistance. Um, we're seeing new opportunities for new tools. We've talked about the vector DT dealing with stress issues as layers, layer counts increase. Those things didn't exist just, that, that application didn't exist just years ago. Um, we're seeing the transition to ALV gap fill Again, it didn't, uh, that application did not exist as an ALD film, therefore not within Lamb's wheelhouse uh, at the last peak. And so not only have we grown our existing positions because of more layers, we've actually added more critical steps to the process. And you know, I think that just, uh, it, it bodes well. Um, at every peak, our goal is to expand our, our serve market in a way that um, if the, you know, we, we come out stronger and, 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 and bigger peak-to-peak. -peak. That's helpful. And if I could follow up, Doug, in your commentary, you talked about expectation for DRAM growth to accelerate from here. I think year-to-date, you guys are up about 13% versus the same period last year. You've had guys like ASML talk about DRAM CapEx being up as much as 60% for them. Now, clearly, they're benefiting from some EUV assertion, but, but any numbers you can put around by, by you know, how big of an acceleration do you expect in the back half of the year? Yeah, John, I'm not going to uh, quantify it because uh, I never do when we're looking in the out segments, but it's going to grow nicely in the second half. It's going to grow nicely uh, because of our patterning positions. And, you know, I feel really good about the trajectory when I look into the second half for DRAM. Uh, it, it's going to be a good second half. Let, let's leave it at that. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Thanks, John. Thank you. We'll take our next question from C.J. Muse of Evercore. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you for taking the question. Uh, I guess first question um, on gross margins. Uh, Doug, can you, can you give us a little more granularity on what's driving um, the headwind uh, sequentially? And I guess as part of that, would would love to hear how we should be thinking about uh, the ramp of, of Malaysia capacity uh, and uh, the impact of gross margins over time. Yeah, no, thanks for the question, CJ. I, I expected this one uh, pretty quickly in the call. Listen, when, when I look out um, over the next quarter, um, there's challenges in the supply chain. Uh, and some of those challenges, as we work to mitigate them, requires incremental spending. When I, when I look at what, what happened in June and what happened in September, maybe the incremental downtick in gross margin is primarily a result of that. Um, so that, that, that's one thing to kind of uh, put, put in the quiver there a little bit to think about as, as we go forward. Um, we'll work our way through that. It'll get better over time. Um, it'll also get better over time, as you rightly ask about, as we ramp Malaysia. Now, right now, when, when I look at Malaysia in the September quarter, it, it's not a benefit to gross margin because we're too early in the ramp of that facility. You've got the fixed costs sitting there, and, and you've got startup costs. So that, that actually is driving a little bit of a headwind right now, too. And over time, that headwind will, will shift to a tailwind as, as we get the benefit of the, the uh, Asia-based cost structure. So, um, you know, I, I look forward. Um, we've got trajectory and gross margin that will get better over time. 
Um, and really right now we're just dealing with the supply chain as we work to mitigate some of the challenges that we see out there. That's great. And as, as a follow-up question, um, I guess perhaps uh, could you provide a little more granularity on, on Reliant? Um, you know, it, it certainly sounds like trailing edge demand is, is, is robust this year, but also should be robust for some time. So would would love to hear your thoughts on how we should be thinking about the contributions there over time. Sure. I, I, uh, I don't think we're going to quantify uh, Reliant itself, but what we can tell you is, um, as you pointed out, it's specialty technologies, it's trailing edge foundry, you know, extremely strong. In fact, you hear from many in the industry, that's where a lot of the chip shortage uh, exists today. And so um, that is an area that's seen tremendous growth. But in many ways, the growth in that area has also been limited um, by the ability of those those companies to ramp and, and equipment to get out to them. And, and we, I, I would fully expect that that's an area, trailing edge foundry, that continues to ramp strongly um, you know, really on into 2022 and, and maybe even beyond. Yeah, and CJ, i just remind you, if you remember back at our investor day in March of last year, it seems like so long ago, but we talked about a, a viewpoint that we still have today that um, the trailing edge or the reliant exposed WFE grows two to three times faster than overall WFE, and that's still, still how we see things. Great. Thank you. Thanks, CJ. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Timothy R. Curry with UBS. Thanks a lot. Um, Doug, I, I, I know you've seen the headlines in China as to um, some, you know, delinquencies from, you know, some of your biggest customers and, you know, some of the debt that they've, you know, that they've defaulted on. So I'm just wondering whether that's having any impact for you, whether there's any uh, – uh, um, thing that you're doing there, whether you're seeing anything that's getting pushed out or any project timing that's changing? Uh, I guess I'd say two things, Tim. Obviously, in a situation like you're alluding to, uh, first thing I do is get on the phone, talk to my guys in China, make sure I understand what's going on. I'm comfortable with where we sit today. Uh, I would tell you that most of the business we do with uh, customers in the China region are under letters of credit, so it's money good. We know it's money good. Um, so that's one thing I'd also uh, have you think about. And relative to the plans of our customers in China, I, I got to be careful about talking about a specific customer, Tim. Um, but we haven't seen any change in anybody's plans as a result of anything. Cool, cool, Doug. Thanks. Um, and then I'll, I'll ask the same question I asked last quarter. The um, this math that you gave, the you know, 70 billion over five years to add 35% bit growth, which is like 15 billion a quarter, and then you gave the number of you know, every 350 million adds another 100 basis points. So if you sort of look at where NAND is running right now, you just sort of conclude, well, you know, maybe you're adding, you know, more like mid-40s bit growth. But I know you've also said, hey, those numbers don't really hold anymore because, you know, capital intensity has gone up as well. So I wonder if you've had time to put pen to paper on maybe brushing up those numbers if we could try to correlate, you know, where we are back to bit growth. Thanks. Yeah, Tim, uh, I'm not ready on the call right now to update any, any of those longer-term numbers. That that would be something we do in a, a, I don't know, an investor day kind of format, which we will do at some point in the future, I think. Um, and you're right, uh, it, the observation that over time, capital intensity grows uh, in in, uh, in that device uh, architecture and NAND. And when we gave those numbers, they were kind of broad averages over long periods of time to try to be helpful, and it's not a static number. So uh, I, I agree with you. We do need to update it. I'm not ready to do it on the call right now. Um, but like Tim said, we're pretty comfortable with the strength of investment in NAND. It, it, it looks pretty um, rational to us. Um, and it's going to be a good year for investment in, in NAND. And actually, I think next year is going to be a, a pretty good year too, Tim. Yeah, if I can just add something, Tim. I mean, it's uh, you know, while I, I agree with the comment and we we made it that the rise in capital intensity probably means those numbers need to be updated on an absolute basis. I want to point out, as the layer count increases and complexity increases, um, we're we're taking actual share as well, meaning we're converting applications that had previously been done with older legacy technologies, and and we're moving those over to newer technologies like ALB. And so we're, we're actually winning new applications as well. So even you know, within whatever that new number is, uh, we're benefiting from an expansion of that per, you know, expansion of spending per bit added, but also from, from actual 
application wins. And you know, we pointed one out that uh, you know, has been a pretty big deal for us, which is the, the conversion to ALD for for gap, dielectric gap fill. So um, I, I think you know, it's uh, another point being. LAM's strong positioning and close collaboration with customers in this space really does give us great in insight into what those next application opportunities are for our company. Thank you, Tim. Helpful. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Krish Sankar with Cowan & Company. Yeah, hi. Thanks for taking my question. I had two of them. First one, either for Tim or Doug. Just to follow up on the NAND, I think you articulated pretty well compared to the prior peak, you know, uh, clearly the layer count has gone up, capital intensity has gone up, and also your shares have gone, your market share has gone up. I'm just kind of curious when you look, at, look to like, you know, the 2018 peak versus today, if I just dig one level below, can you just say the mix of dielectric and conductor edge then versus today? Because it seems to me that dielectric edge process times have gone up. That's also a big factor in it. So I'm just kind of curious, A, is that right? And if so, is there a meaningful difference in the split between dielectric and conductor edge for LAN in NAN today versus, you know, in 2018, and then I had a follow-up. Sure. Uh, well, a number of things have, have changed. I mean, and as you mentioned, you know, the dielectric edge is, is fundamentally tied to, and its process time is fundamentally tied to layer count. So clearly it's, it's scaling pretty dramatically as these, uh, as, as layer counts grown. Um, the, the other element, you know, and you, process time is uh, relative to uh, consumables and therefore growth in our installed based business as well, which also scales nicely with, uh, with, in, with uh, layer count growth. So there are a number of changes, but, but sure, dielectric catch um, plays a very critical role in uh, greeting and layer count expansion. Got it, got it. Thanks. Just I just want to check on the Sensei Edge platform, the smart platform that you have. I'm just kind of curious, you know, as you roll out the platform, is there the risk of losing the install base advantage since if customers have to look at Sensei, why don't they look at another platform like a Simply or whatever it might be? So would Sensei actually be a slight negative for you given the fact that your install base advantage goes away? Well, I mean, there's two, two elements to um, what makes a great tool. One is the platform. One is the process module technology. And so, you know, I think that, you know, when, when, uh, when we're enhancing the platform capability, adding all of this equipment intelligence, we're certainly not giving up the, the incumbency power um, that's been developed. I mentioned even today, proprietary RF systems, um, proprietary uniformity solutions, um, the new uh, Vantex module, that's on the Sensei platform kind of marries up all of that equipment intelligence and use of data to make our um, market leading uh, etch chamber even that much better. And so um, clearly we, we thought a lot about the power of incumbency, but um, if, you, if you stagnate, you also leave an opportunity for your uh, for competitors to catch up and that's, that's not our plan. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Our next comment comes from Stacy Raskin with Bernstein Research. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, my first question, I wanted to ask about leverage. And, and I know operating leverage, and I, and I understand what's going on with gross margins next quarter and everything, but if I just want to look at the, the analyst day model, like the midpoint I think was something like mid-33s in EPS on a $16 billion revenue number. Your run rating revenue right now over $17 billion, which is the high end of that guide, and your run rating EPS sort of below the midpoint of the analyst day guide. So I guess how do we think – I think EPS is like 10% below or even more. So how do we think about, I guess, the progression of operating leverage from here as we go forward? And like even if revenues don't grow, should we think about like, – over what time frame do we think about EPS kind of like reaching um, those kind of model, uh, model levels um, that, were, that you talked about uh, not that long ago? Yes, Stacey, I, I would tell you that there, you know, there's a, a revenue level uh, component to the leverage. There's also a time element to it. Uh, the time element is dictated by some things like ramping a new factory in Malaysia that's got a better cost structure. 
it's also driven by ramping a new, a new edge platform like Sensei that we think will have a better profitability profile than, uh, than the one before it because it delivers incremental benefit to it. So when I look at the leverage that we had in, in that model, um, I still feel quite good about it when I think through and look at the time aspects of how we deliver uh, the benefit. And it's still the right, thing, the right way to think about it. The, the financial model we put out in, uh, in March of last year is the right way to think about the profitability uh, opportunity for LAMP. Got it. Thank you. Um, and for my follow-up, again, I, I want to I hit on the NAND point again. Um, Last quarter, you were explicit about saying that you thought NAND would grow, I guess, half over half in, in the second half. And, and you seem to be suggesting that pretty strongly for DRAM now, but you didn't, you weren't explicit about NAND. But you also, I think I did hear you say that you thought NAND would be in general strong this year, would be strong next year. So do you still think NAND grows in the second half of the calendar year? And I guess you sounded like you expect NAND in, in calendar 22 to, to be up from calendar 2021. Is that what you're trying to say? Uh, I'm not trying to really say anything about 22 with the except, exception that it, it, it looks like it continues to be strong it is, is the qualitative statement I made. It, it's too soon for us to put numbers around 22, uh, Stacey. Um, and, and when we look at WFE, um, so a quarter ago we were talking about trending above 75. Tim now said we see it trending above 80. Uh, I think overall it's a second half weighted uh, WFE profile. Uh, DRAM looks solid in the second half. Foundry Logic looks pretty good in the second half too. I, I think NAND probably as I sit here today is more balanced half on half. Uh, and a quarter ago we said look, looked like it was a little bit second half. I can still see that potentially happening, but there's some mm -hmm. uh, customer investment timings that, that might occur more in the first half of next year. Right now, it, it looks kind of balanced half on half as, as we sit here today. Got it, got it. I guess that's still a couple quarters ago you were saying those would be down, so you're kind of like dialing it in as we go forward. Yeah, I mean, as, as the year unfolds, obviously we get better visibility to, to what's happening, and we're now halfway through the year. And if yeah. you include the guide for September, we're three quarters of the way through the year. So we just have better visibility in what's going on relative to timing, as well as the supply challenges the industry is having. Mm -hmm. Got it. That's helpful. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Harlan Sir with J.P. Morgan. Oh, good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. Um, good to see the team ramping uh, its new Penang Systems Manufacturing Facility and uh, unlocking a little bit more revenue capacity here in the second half. My understanding is that the team is targeting $3 billion of potential annual systems revenue capacity by the middle of next year out of Penang. So a pretty meaningful part of your future revenue profile. And I think the goal is also to source more raw materials, machining, and other support services locally over the next few years in Malaysia. So all of this should provide the team with some pretty strong gross margin tailwinds. Was most of this tailwind encompassed in the 2023-2024 target financial model or is this a source of margin upside above your targets as you go revenues into this new facility over the next few years? Yeah, Harlan, what I would say is we always knew we were ramping uh, a factory in Malaysia. So when we put that model out um, I don't know, a year and a half ago, it was comprehended. We knew how big the factory was going to be. We knew when it would be ramping and so forth. So it was all in in terms of uh, the profitability. And I kind of referenced that uh, with Stacy's question. Um, so there isn't upside, but it is how we continue to deliver the leverage that we see. I don't know, Tim, if you'd add anything or want to add anything. Yeah, no, and I, th I think it's just that the uh, the, the current dem demand environment we're in today, you know, that the ramp rate for Malaysia is uh, kind of flat out. And we, while well, we haven't given any numbers for uh, 2022, so I'm not sure not sure where you got those, but uh, um, clearly we're we're ramping it. It will be a big facility for us, and it will uh, it will eventually take on a, a large uh, position within our global manufacturing network. Yeah, thanks for the insights on that. And then on some of the uncertainties on supply chain and therefore slightly wider revenue range on the guidance, you know, your systems have very advanced capabilities, right? Compute, storage systems, complex sensor networks, our power circuitry, graphics, user interface capabilities. Is the team being impacted by the chip shortages with some of your advanced platforms that have a lot of these processor, memory, RF-type content? 
Yeah, Harlan. I mean, it's uh, you know when we sat here probably a quarter or two ago, and we were thinking capacity constraints. Uh, you know, we were really thinking about physical space and labor. And quite honestly, I think we've done a really nice job expanding. You know, we've expanded in, in our Livermore, California facility, our, our Oregon facility, Korea, um, as I just said, shipping from Malaysia. So that physical capacity we're really starting to, to sort of free up. We've hired a tremendous number of people also across across the globe. Um, and now we're being hit with that next level. We have very complex supply chain, and you're right, it's ship shortages, compo- you know, shortages of other components as well. And uh, because it, it can affect many different players within our supply chain, it's uh, a little bit more unpredictable, and that's leading to um, some of the, the increased guidance that Doug spoke to. Um, again, you know, I, I think that LAM is very proud of our ability to execute, and uh, you know, I think these are, these are issues that just every day we're working through, and uh, uh, with time we would expect that these, just like for the rest of the industry, will, will begin to be resolved. Great, thank you. Thank you, Harlan. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Vivek Arya with Bank of America Securities. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, the first one, um, I'm curious, what is your um, estimate of China as a percentage of uh, WFE uh, this year versus last? Is it in line with what you thought at the start of the year? And have you heard of any uh, potential restrictions on uh, shipping to any Chinese uh, customers uh, from a U.S. Uh, regulatory uh, perspective? Vivek, I'll take it, and then Tim can feel free to add on. I think from a percent of WFE, probably fairly consistent. I mean, WFE overall this year is is up nicely. China's up nicely, too. Um, and we have talked about license requirements for one of our foundry customers uh, in China. No new update for you there, uh, Tim, unless you want to uh, share something. Uh, but it doesn't impact anything else that we see going on in China. Yeah, we're we're actively engaged. As Doug said, we haven't seen significant movement on the licensing front. Um, we will say we've, you know, we've seen a, a, the approval of a few licenses for uh, spares and upgrades for mature technology nodes. So I guess if we were any update, that we would say uh, some small progress. Um, but we're you know we're actively engaged with the licensing agencies uh, within the government. Um, one to ensure we're fully compliant with with everything they have in place today, but also to be advocating for moving forward uh, with additional uh, approvals um, on um, other shipments that are pending. All right. And for my um, follow-up, uh, you sound you know, sort of optimistic about uh, the, the growth opportunity uh, for spending um, next year. Um, I'm wondering, of your markets, uh, is there one market do you think that will have a, kind of a greater rise in capital uh, intensity um, right going into next year? Is it Foundry La- Logic? Is it DRAM? Is it NAND? And conceptually, how does that impact your, your share gain uh, potential as you look at um, next year? I, I realize you're not giving a specific WFE um, number, but let's say if you're in a growth environment, um, right? Is there one market where you think, uh, given all the technology changes, that there is uh, going to be a, a greater than average rise in uh, capital intensity? Thank you. Sure. Yeah, no, no. It's a, you know, I guess you can interpret from all the comments I've made about multi-year uh, uh, impact to WFE spending. You know, we see strong regional investments, many places government-supported, rising device complexity, and then actually we think the, the demand environment still remains good overall for semis. So those are, you know, while we're not giving 2022 right now, we don't see uh, gray clouds on the horizon. We, we see a lot of positives. Um, when I think about different areas of, of opportunity for LAM, to your point about what, where might capital intensity be rising the fastest or, or maybe just spending, you know, I really think about LAM, and therefore where is etch and depth really going to play a bigger role? Where does LAM have the opportunity? You know, I see that across the board. We, we spent a lot of time on this call talking about NAND complexity, but you know, you're seeing 3D transitions, foundry logic space, gate all around, uh, advanced packaging, very etch and depth intensive. Next year, you know, if you're looking, I'm not saying it's flat WFE, but if you were looking at flat WFE, LAM's opportunity would be growing in those spaces because of etch and depth capital intensity increases. And you know, we're, where we really are spending our time and effort um, this year Maybe it's two places. Doug talked a lot about operational improvements, making sure we come out with infrastructure that's better off from that perspective. And what I tried to highlight was 
you know, where we are investing in products so that as these transitions occur to 3D in Foundry Logic and DRAM over the next several years, the LAM's going to be in the same position to benefit from those as what I highlighted uh, happens for us in 3D NAND. And that's, you know, I think it's uh, places I just talked about, selective edge, it's things like dry resist, it's the, the position we have in high aspect ratio, etch and depth relative to 3D packaging. Um, I would just say it's a, it's a very uh, opportunity rich environment for, for a company like LAM right now. Thanks very much. Yep, thank you. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Toshia Hari with Goldman Sachs. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thanks so much for taking uh, my questions. I had two as well. Um, I guess this one's probably for Doug. I think historically you guys have spoken to, um, you know, your thoughts on DRAM and NAND supply growth exiting the year. Um, I was hoping you can you can update us um, how you're thinking about that exiting 2021 based on, you know, what you've shipped in the first half and what your expectations are for the second half, um, supply growth exiting the year relative to demand growth for both DRAM and NAND? Yeah, DRAM, I think this year, uh, supply growth is still going to be below where demand growth is. I think uh, pr pretty well chronicled from, from the industry that demand for DRAM bits is probably 20, low 20s. I think supply is probably high teens approaching 20 in, in DRAM. I think on the NAND side, probably more in balance. Uh, I, I think supply demand mid high 30s. Um, in, it feels fairly balanced for the year in in NAND. Got it. Um, and then as a quick follow up, um, wanted to ask a question about your opportunity in leading edge logic. Um, I think in the past you've you've talked about your application wins. Uh, I guess initially at 14 and how that, that's expanded at 10 and, and your expectations as we sort of eventually transition to seven. Um, I guess despite some of those comments, you, you, we, we haven't really seen that, you know, show up in numbers. And, and I realize you, you, you disclosed logic and other, so there's an other component in that line. But, um, you know, what, what are you missing? Um, I, I think that one, I, I realize you don't want to Talk, talk about a specific customer, but that customer is ramping CapEx, yet we're not seeing the uh, uplift in, in, in your numbers. Thank you. Yeah, I think I'd say uh, two things. You've got the story right, 14 to 10, we talked about a nice growth in application footprint, 5X is what we described in terms of number of applications, and then uh, that growing again from 10 to 7. That is absolutely what we see happening, uh, and I've got to be careful talking about any one customer. I, I think when you look at logic and other, you're absolutely right. There is the other component in there, things like image sensor uh, and, and other logic devices. But but also you have to think about the time frame in which any one customer is investing in a technology. Is it in a concentrated, you know, two or three quarters, or is it over a longer period of time? Um, and if it's over a longer period of time, you won't see it in in any one quarter. And so I would encourage you to think about both of those things when you look at the logic and other stuff. Um, and then I'd also suggest, I, I think Logic and others are going to look pretty good in the second half also. Yeah, and I, th I think the only thing I would add is, you know, maybe we need to transition. That story before was a lot about uh, progress we were going to make in uh, Etch. And, and, you know, I've talked, now we, we step up, we say Logic or, or Logic and Foundry, basically similar devices, similar trends. Um, as we move to gate all around or nano sheet structures, you know, many of the products I talked about, um, dealing with selective etch and the, the, um, the processes that are required to create those complex structures. The challenges that uh, Foundry and Logic customers at that leading edge see with um, RC and its impact, and therefore the, the need for evolving the metallization structure. Um, you know, we talked about dry resist and the, the potential to impact the cost performance of, of EUV at future nodes, not only current node, but also high NA. These are, these are ways in which LAM is ensuring that uh, we have the right product portfolio. So whether it's advanced boundary or advanced logic, whichever customer you might be talking about, that we have uh, very strong products to offer uh, to, to help with those transitions. And so um, I think over the years, our opportunity to engage those customers has just uh, gotten stronger and broader. Great, thank you.
Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We'll take a next question from Joe Moore of Morgan Stanley. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so you've had a couple quarters now of the installed base business growing 50% year on year, and you know we don't have a long time series of that. But I mean, is that an? I assume that's kind of a historically unusual growth rate, and you know anything in that 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 sort of makes you think. You know, you, I think you mentioned last quarter people accumulating spares or inventory a little bit. I mean, obviously that's a growth, a really good growth business, and you've been vocal about that. But you know, is there any cyclicality when you start talking about these types of growth rates that we should be aware of? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. I, I included in my uh, my prepared remarks one line there that said uh, was supposed to be hinting, uh, please don't count on this kind of growth every single quarter, quarter on quarter. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so. There are there are components. I mean, and you know, this kind of went back to the question about trailing edge foundry and how do we see that going forward. You know, we don't see that abating, but that is an area where we're seeing tremendous demand right now, and you know, eventually that may not kind of keep pace quite with the uh, the growth in the install base. But um, no, the elements you think about what's in there. You know, spares continues to grow with install base, and as we've seen this tremendous growth in install base, that becomes a recurring revenue stream going forward that really is just based on customers continuing to utilize what they've already bought. So we feel very good about that. So if there's one part that, that you might see a little bit of um, investment timing impact, it would be specialty technologies and trailing edge uh, or non-leading edge foundry. Um, but our, our near-term outlook for that remains quite strong. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Patrick Ho of Steeple. Uh, thank you very much, and congrats on a nice quarter. Um, Doug, maybe for you, in terms of the, the uh, component and supply constraints that you're facing, I know there's a lot of moving parts, uh, but what are you trying to do to kind of, quote, mitigate it? And I, I guess what I'm looking for is a little more detail. Are you working with additional suppliers? Are you working uh, with your main component suppliers of getting those parts at a certain period of time? What are some of those, I guess, initiatives and efforts you're doing to try and uh, you know, I guess, mitigate that situation. I think I'm going to actually give it to Tim. Yeah, I'm actually I'm actually pretty close to this, this one. And uh, what, I, what I would say is that they're, you know, maybe it's everything. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, when you have your, your major customers really clamoring for, for, uh, for on-time shipments, um, you know, we're leaving no stone unturned. So, you know, in some cases it's working with different suppliers, but, again, we have complex supply chains. And, you know, in many, in maybe the, many cases we're looking at where those suppliers have additional facilities in other parts of the world. So if we're impacted, say, by uh, issues throughout the COVID pandemic in one part of the world, uh, we transition to that same supplier in a different factory in other parts of the world. That's usually the most expeditious means of, of getting additional uh, supply. But at times we are um, uh, finding additional suppliers. You know, we're also, I talked about re refurbishment and recoding and reuse. You know, that's another area where you know, we're working with customers to actually qualify refurbishment processes that allow us to shorten the time. You know, so rather than having to procure brand new parts, for instance, we do a refurbishment, and, and that, that part can go back into the machine. And that um, from uh, the fewer parts you use within the installed base, the more you have available to build forward out of your factories. And so I would just say between us and the customers, very close collaboration and collaboration with our supply chain partners are getting very creative about how to try to mitigate these risks. And uh, it's, it's many, many, many different things. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Operator, we have time for one more question, please. Thank you. We'll take our last question from Joe Quattrochi with Wells Fargo. Yeah, thanks for taking the question. I just wanted to try to understand the the kind of updated WIC guidance and your commentary around, you know, NAN being maybe a little bit more balanced half on half. I guess, can you help me understand just, you know, what, I guess, increase to maybe offset some of that, including, you know, going to over $80 billion for WIC? Was it just more foundry logic, or is that you know, your comments around DRAM being stronger? Just uh, any comments there would be helpful. I, th I think the practicality of it, uh, Joe, is we're just further through the year, right? We're, ha we're halfway through the year. We got pretty good visibility into the September quarter because we just guided it, and, and, and so it's that, right? It's an understanding of customers' plans. It's an understanding of what we think the industry is going to be able to supply. 
we still see a second half weighted uh, WFE spending profile. Um, we ticked it up uh, somewhat as a result of just better visibility is what I would describe. Okay, that's helpful. And then just a quick question on, on the services business. You know, another quarter of a major spares contract when I was wondering if you could quantify maybe how much of your spares revenue is based on long-term contracts. No. <laughs> <laughs> No, no. We uh, um, obviously we look we look at that uh, uh, quite a bit, but I would say that uh, a large portion of it, whether it's under long-term contracts or, you know, it's in, you know, I talked about our complex supply chain. I mean, in many ways, for spare parts, it's it's very similar. Which means, regardless of the length of contract, uh, we tend to be the primary supplier for the vast majority of those spares. And so, um, I would say that the majority uh, of our parts are under contract but then the length of contract we're not really uh, ready to talk about at this point. Fair enough. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Great. Thanks. Okay, operator, I think that was uh, our last call. Tina, do you want to close this off? Yeah, I just want to tell everyone we appreciate your support and thank you for joining our call today. This concludes today's call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.